he's known for his real talk, straightforward attitude, dark sense of humor, and above all else, his Patan Kufi. Once he's gotten your attention, which will be instant, the Big Easy is a force not to be reckoned with. We dare you. Hailing from London, UK, Sheikh Abu Isa studied both pharmacy and anthropology at the University of Manchester and later studied Arabic, Islamic law, and Quran from scholars around the world. He's passionate about global humanitarian causes and is the founder of Prophetic Guidance and the strategic director of First Ethical Charitable Trust. Sheikh Abu Isa brings a certain kind of flavor packed with a powerful punch. At the end of his session, you'll be left wondering, wow. What just happened? Without the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not going anywhere. Without the Rahmah of Allah, we are not even going to smell Jannah. Forget about get there. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm not too sure what you guys are all here for. I think that you guys are here to hear some kind of great talk or something. But I'm afraid Ottawa got that last week. <laughs> I'm only here to eat alhamdis this evening, that's all. <laughs> I'm going to the ghetto. The ghetto. MashaAllah, I heard that, uh, alhamdulillah, I heard that uh, my boy Farhan Abdul Aziz, he rocked this joint like a boss. <laughs> Smashed it right out of the park. Bismillah, MashaAllah. You know, you gotta keep uh, an eye on him. You know, he's, uh, he's an amazing brother, mashallah. He's gonna go huge. He's gonna go big. Anyway, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about what I didn't get a chance to speak about last week and uh, in Ottawa. I'm so happy actually that I'm speaking before Sheikh Walid because I'm gonna do what he did to me, basically give him no time left. <laughs> he cut me up so bad, subhanAllah, I had like a one hour lecture, he gave me like about 10 minutes. So Sheikh Walid, I don't know where he is, but so when he comes, then he's gonna realize, don't mess with AE. <laughs> so, what I wanna speak about um, is a topic which is dear to my heart. Uh, it's called Ulu uh, al Now, Ulu uh, al you know many people struggle to try and translate what it actually means. Uh, you could say, I mean, I'd call it raising the game. That's because, you know, that's the way we speak, raising the game. Um, it's like uh, having a high ambition, a lofty, a lofty aspiration, having uh, that intention to take it higher and higher. Yourself, reaching into yourself and pushing it, um, as we all know we can do. And I thought that perhaps we can look at some of the principles behind attaining the very best. And I thought that the only way we can actually do that is to try and understand who we are first as human beings. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created insan, uh, mankind, from three basic components. Now, the first is the ruh, if you like, the, the soul. And that is from the matters of the ghayb. And we do not know much about that. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically tells us in the Quran that actually of this issue, you've only been given very little knowledge. And so we say, alhamdulillah, we believe in it. And then the second component is the, the, the body itself, the physical part of our body, if you like. And that's made from trab or teen, and we know that. And the third aspect of our, or the third component of a human being is the aql, the intellect. Now this intellect is a very important aspect of our creation because it is by this intellect that we are distinguished from other creations. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the malaika. Now, the malaika are actually, inshallah, in this room here. That's pretty insane when you think about that, you know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the malaika to those places where he is remembered. And today has been a day of Quran. And the people talking about the Quran, this is like the best dhikr which is possible. And therefore, this makes this a halak from the halakat of dhikr, from the circles of dhikr. So we have angels amongst us. And angels, they are created in a very unique way. They have taklif, taklif meaning legal responsibility, meaning that they have to do what they are told. But they have no desires. 
They have no desires. They're not held hostage to what they may like or may they want to do or, or lust after. They don't even have that. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون that they do not dis disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what they have been commanded. They only do what they have been commanded to do. That's it. They are told do and they do it. The thought of not doing it, not wanting to do it, doesn't even enter into their mind. يُسَبِّحُونَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ لَا يَفْتُرُونَ They exalt him night and day. They don't get tired. They don't pull back. They keep going. They keep going. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created another creation, the exact opposite of the angels. The al-hayawan uh, al-bahimi, yani the animals basically. And the animals are the exact opposite in that they have no taklif, no legal responsibility. So they don't have to actually be held accountable for their actions. They don't need to worry about anything like that. As for their desires, well that is their whole basis of their life. They are completely overpowered by their desires. And that is why when we act in a very base way, in a very poor way, we say this is animalistic behavior. We're following our desires. The whole concept of bestiality and animalistic behavior is acting like an animal that has no other function but just to live and eat and do whatever they do. And this, and this reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us in the Quran. And you guys want to hear about the Quran and I want to try and give you this picture from the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created insan bang in the middle. So we have the hayawan on this side and we have the malaika on the other side. We have been given the aql and legal responsibility for our actions, meaning we will be held accountable for everything as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done for the malaika. Yet, unfortunately, we have been given desires, strong desires, which we have to control and which we will be held accountable for. Therefore, when we slip up, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes us just like that creation that have been overpowered by their desires. Animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they are actually like cattle. This is when human beings, they drop their standards and they act stupid. In hum kal an'am. They are like cattle. Bal hum adullu sabila. In fact, actually no. They are, they are more astray. That's what Allah says. Actually, they are more astray. And that is something to really think about. That when you are letting yourself down with poor behavior, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comparing you to the worst of actual creation. A creation that has no, pay, no, 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 no function, no objective, no real yani, point out of life. If you're not held accountable for something, you're not going to Jannah. If you're not held accountable for your actions, you have nothing to live for except this dunya. So you will do whatever you do in this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, those who disbelieve, those who are not interested in our signs, those who reject our signs, what do they do? They just chill out, spend their whole life tossing, enjoying themselves. They just eat. And how do they eat? Just constantly eating, eating, eating. They eat like cattle. Cattle, you know, when you watch them, they just go here and they just have a little nibble. Then they go there and they have a little nibble. Then they go there and they graze and they graze. and they, There's no function to their life. Then they're going to eat and eat and eat. Then I'm going to come along, I'm going to slice, I'm going to eat as a big steak. That's it. That's the function of their life, just to be our, under our subjugation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, yani, it's a very serious issue to be compared to yeah, the worst of creation. And in another, from another angle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story of, as the Mufassirin said, the man, a man called Bala'am, who was at the time of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, this man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed actually and had given him knowledge, had given him knowledge of the signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him, What do alayhim naba alladhi ataynahu ayatina? Fansalakha minha fa'atbahu shaytan fa'kana minal ghawin. Tell them, 
Ya Muhammad. The story of the one that we gave knowledge of our signs. But he let it slide. He wasn't interested in the signs. So Shaitan hooked him up. فَأَتْبَعْهُ Shaitan, And he then became from those people who went astray. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about a person, not an ordinary person, but a person that we had given knowledge, had given the idea and the understanding of our signs. Okay? Now you know what's so important about that? That means that Allah is talking about a person who is the same as every single person in this room, i.e. a practicing Muslim, a practicing slave of Allah. One who has been given the knowledge of the reality and who tries to actually act upon that reality. But you know what he did? He just drifted away from those, those signs. Shaitan Shaitan then hooked him up. That's what Shaitan does. That's his daily occupation. He just goes around hooking people up. And I want to tell you something. You have better, you had better understand that the people that he wants to hook up most are the people in this room. He's not interested in those masakeen outside. He's not interested in the people who don't practice Islam, who don't come to the masajid, who don't read Quran, who don't practice the deen, who don't keep good company. He's not interested in those folks. Those folks are taken. Those folks were so easy, they actually went to shaitan. Shaitan didn't even have to go after them. But these people, as Allah has described, the ones that have been given the signs, i.e. the Muslims, they are the MVPs that the shaitan is after. MVP, they are the most valuable people, not a player, people. They are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed and they are the big catch, the big fish, the big prize that shaitan is after all the time. Because when you take these boys down, you take the community down. Because when the practicing Muslim slips up, you can be 100% sure that every single person is waiting for that. People are going to hate. They love hating. And they love hating on practicing Muslims. So when they see the one in hijab go, when they see the one in the beard go, when they see the one in the thobe go, and go can be anything from start breaking away from the masjid, start following their desires, start getting obsessed yani, by following all this celebrity nonsense and bakwasas out there, this kind of fitna is an absolutely engulfing disease which is encompassing every aspect of our life. The social networks that we use for keeping company and doing dawah have now turned on us and are feeding us information and feeding us meat and food for our desires at a rate of knots which is astonishing. So much so that our brains have now lost the ability to have patience with anything over a page long or a spoken word or a video or a lecture over five minutes. You know how that happened? Because we're getting so much information, so regularly, stimulating our brains like this every single second. One tweet, three tweets, six tweets, 70, this, update, comment, notification, comment, information. He did this, she did that, I did this. It's insane. The mind cannot handle good quality information anymore. The only way you can do it is to go and go into some kind of corner and cut everything off, all internet, all devices, and just pretend that you have gone back a hundred years. And then you have your mental breakdown after five minutes, then you go back home. <laughs> People try it. People have good intentions. People even say, you know what? I'm leaving my phone at home. I'm going to Hajj and Umrah. I, that's the greatest place that, you know, that I'm going to be so preoccupied with the haram and I'm going to do tawaf. And I'm going to do rak'ah this and I'm going to get 100,000 reward for this. I'm going to get 100,000 reward for that. And you're kalam fadi, kalam fadi. Because when you go over there, then you go and hook up the sim and you say, who does cheap sims to International Course America and who does good sims this. And then you put it in uh, a phone that you buy cheap and you're back on the, the, the whole. You know, this is it's insane. We are completely yani, yani, shackled to the reality of this current world. And this is behavior which is becoming of animals only. It is becoming of animals because our desires cannot be held disciplined. We are losing our discipline. And this is a serious matter, my brothers and sisters. I want to tell you about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about this person, Bala'm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we just said, He gave him 
the signs. فانسلخ منها. He went away from these signs. شيطان hooked him up. فكان من الغاوين. ولو شئنا لرفعناه بها. If we wanted, we would have elevated him by these signs that we gave him. We could have done that. ولكنه أخلد إلى الأرض. You know what he did? He actually got obsessed and addicted to the dunya. He clung to the earth. And he followed his desire. Then Allah did tell us something very interesting. He says, you know this person? His example, His example is like a dog. If you try and, you know, hook him up, if you try and tell him to do something, okay, try and tell him, the dog, it starts panting. And if you tell him to come here, it starts panting. And if you leave the dog alone, it starts panting. That is the example of the people who deny our signs. Allah tells Muhammad tell them these stories so the people who listen will reflect over it. So are you reflecting over this Bal'am, this man that Allah gave the signs to and who left those signs and followed his desires and therefore he's like a dog? How is he like a dog? Have you seen a dog? Have you seen that when you leave him, when he's sick, miskin, he's panting. <laughs> when he's healthy, he's panting. <laughs> miskin, he's always panting. You can give him lots of meat, you give him lots of water, you can starve him for three days. <laughs> All the same. Useless, isn't it? There's no benefit in doing anything. He's panting. That's what Allah wants to say. That whatever you do to him, he's panting. Whatever you help him, he's panting. This is this person. He has followed his desires. Shaitan hooked him up. There's no coming back for this guy. Whether you try and give him da'wah, he's gone. Whether you try to leave him, he's gone. This is scary, brothers and sisters. If you do not let this Quran impact you, if you are reading this Quran in some kind of cultural fashion that only packs no best, which is to wrap it up 26 times, bring it down, have a look at it, oh, that looks great. Have a read a page, have no idea what you're reading, put it back up, blow dust off, put it back away. If this is your Quranic practice and this is your connection with Quran, then my goodness me, you are in for a big shock one day. You are in for a serious shock because this Quran was not meant to be read like that. This Quran was meant to impact upon you and to be read and understood and to be learned and to be acted upon. This is a serious issue. I look at this story of this Bal'am and I look at myself and I think this could be me. I look at this story and I see hundreds upon thousands of Muslims at threat of what this man went through. People who have been given the da'wah, who know what they're doing, and yet they let their desires take over their lives and they lose their religion over it. They're like a dog, gone. No trying to hook that person up. This is important to internalize, my brothers and sisters. Now, I want to say that with respect to raising one's aspiration, himma. You know the word himma? The word himma comes from a understanding, and you heard the dua from Sheikh Muhammad uh, just recently. The word yani, uh, hum or humum is one's anxiety or one's stress, literally speaking. But it also means one's concern, that which yani, is playing on your mind, that which basically makes you reflect all the time. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told the Prophet sallam, in the dua to not make this dunya our main concern. Okay? Don't make this dunya our main hum. Now this himma, from the same word, what we're trying to say is lift it out of this temporal nonsense that we are living in. Make your himma something higher. And I'm not just talking Jannah. I'm talking the very highest of Jannah. It's a poor Muslim who thinks, you know what, I just want to go to Jannah. Yes, that might be shocking. But I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it's a poor Muslim. Because you'll be crying if you just accept Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ told us in Sahih Bukhari, when the companions, he was there with the companions, he said, do you, see how, do you see how you're looking at those stars up there in the east and the west? That's how the people in Jannah will be looking up at the chambers and the rooms of the people who are in Firdaus. Firdaus al-A'la. The distance, yani, 
like this, the heavens and the earth. Companions were like, Phew. are these for the prophets only, Annie? The Prophet said, I swear by the one in who my soul is in his hand. This is for the men and women who just believe in Allah and his messenger. For the Muslims, for the Muslims, for the Muslims who have some concern, who like to reach to the next level, who know that they can reach in deep into their heart. Keep it simple, but act deep, believe deep, think deep, act deep, act deep. There are people who feel that, how can you, can you imagine yourself being in Jannah? And I know that's great, and I'm not here to knock anyone down, but can you imagine you're in Jannah and you're looking up there? Where do you think the Prophet Muhammad is? You think he's down at this level? He's up there with the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, the Salihin, the rest of the Prophets. They are all at the top. The Prophet وسلم, said again in the authentic hadith, Inna fil that there are a hundred levels in paradise. A hundred levels. Allah has prepared them for those who strive, who do jihad. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who tried their best in every aspect of life. The distance between each level is the distance between the heavens and the earth. Can you imagine that a hundred times? The heavens and the earth? That's insane. Then the Prophet said the statement which I want you to reflect upon. So if you're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything, then you ask him for firdaus. The very best of Jannah. Because it is the middle of Jannah, and it is the highest of Jannah, and it is the best of Jannah, and the only thing which is above that is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ar-Rahman. That's what you've been told to do, my brothers and sisters. That's what your prophet expects you to do, to take it to the next level, to raise your game. We are here to raise the game. We are here to ask not for the mediocre or for the normal or for the good. We're here to ask for the best. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahmatullah alayhi, he has a statement which is so mind-blowing. As I said to the people in Ottawa, I'm going to get this statement, I'm going to engrave it in wood, and I'm going to stick it above my bed, and I'm going to hang it on the wall, and when the people see it and they say it's bid'ah, I'm going to say alhamdulillah. You know what he said? He said, Ya Allah, you blessed me with Islam, and I did not ask you for it. Ya Allah, Bless me with Firdaus and I am asking you for it. Oh, that is big time. Big people share quotes, this, that. That's big time. That's a Shafi. This is a competition, brothers and sisters. This is a game. Oh yes, life is a game. We know the conditions, we know the rules. We are the players. وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ So in this game, then let the people compete with one another. Go for it. Go for it. وَاسْتَفَسْتَبِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Race to that which is good. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ أَرْضُحَ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Allah says, race, rush for forgiveness. For a paradise that is as wide as the heavens and the earth that has been prepared for the muttaqeen. This is where it's at. This is the game. This is what we have to do. We have to keep pushing each other. We have to keep aiming higher. Firdaus is where it's at. Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on Friday. And he said to him, this is a great day for you and your ummah. The Prophet ﷺ said, how so? And Jibreel said, huh? You know this day, you have one hour in this day, that if you make dua in it, it will be responded to. You will be given. 
with response, in response to your, uh, your dua. And we also have something as well. We also have something. Prophet Hassanam is yani, intrigued, huh? Yani, Jibreel is saying that we have something, yani, the angels. So you can see that he pushes him to tell him what's going on. So Jibreel says to him, ah, well, in Firdaus, this is narrated in the Tabarani and it's good, it's not. He goes in Firdaus every Friday. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to visit us. And here we have the Siddiqeen, we have the Shuhada, we have the greatest of the greatest of people, and they are in the utmost of luxury and ease, and they are sitting on thrones, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appears to them, and He says to them, is there anything I can do for you? The people are like, anything you can do for us? Allah, we just want you to be happy with us. We just want you to be happy with us. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them? He said, Qad raditu ankum. He said, have no doubt I am very happy with you. Walakum ma For you is whatever you wish. Waladayya mazid. And anything else? We've got more of that. You want any else of that? We've got more of that where that came from. Waladayya mazid. I have it all and more and more and more. And you're saying that I'm going to go for this, I'm going to aim for this, I'm just going to try and pass, I'm just going to pray this, I'm going to just do the obligations, I'm going... Brothers and sisters, this does not befit the Muslim. The Muslim is a creature of itqan and a creature of ihsan. He chooses his actions and he really dives into his actions and does them to the very, very best of his ability. Itqan, perfection, ihsan, moving to the next level taking everything up. And I will tell you that you may think this is so difficult. We should just yani, do what we can do from the obligations. And that's good. And that's good. But don't be scared to take it to the next level because the second you step up, Allah will be with you. Because in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ has also said that my slave does not come close to me. He does not come close to me as he does as he does with the obligatory actions, with the obligatory acts of worship that I have put upon them. But my slave does not continue except come closer to me by the more nafal and the sunnah and the voluntary actions that he or she does. And then if he does that, I will love him. If I love this slave of mine, the one who does the obligations and ticks that off and then goes to the voluntary actions and keeps going and keeps pushing and keeps raising the game, then I will love him. And if I love him, I will be the hearing that he hears with. And I will be the sight that he sees with. And I will be the hand that he strikes with. And I will be the foot that he walks with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you divine light, divine power, will bless your every single action, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be afraid to up your game. Allah will be there for you when you up your game. He will help you. This is how the people, they would, they would move forward. The companions, when we look at them, we hear so many stories, but how many people reflect? We are suffering badly from poor ambition. We are suffering badly from this low concern for taking it to the next level. Not just ourselves, but our children, our women. Our children, you know, subhanAllah, it's a... You know, I was listening to one of the mashayikh, and he was saying to me, we're living in a generation where the last people are dying out, where we would go to our parents and we would kiss their heads and their hands and ask how they are and see if we can do something for them. We are now living in a time where the parents have to go and kiss the heads and the hands of the children to ask them for something. To akis al-umur, they've turned around completely. We have women who are actually, can you believe this, actually 
preventing their husbands from going to the masjid from five times a day. Can you believe that? They are women who do not have a concern to push themselves and their nafs down and to raise their deen. However difficult it may be, however much time that they need with their spouses and family time and quality time because they're working and because they're this, because they're that. And the men, I'm not even going to start on the men. We know, yeah, about the men. Waste of time, the men. They are not even, even thinking about, yeah, they hear this, yeah, the missus say, listen, hey, you know, you can go tomorrow. Okay, then. You know? Massive resistance, Yanni. Don't, Yanni, don't make me, Yanni. You know? Because I really want to go. Poor quality. Poor quality is endemic in our, in, our, in our communities. You know, I was reflecting upon the ghazawat of the Prophet Sallallahu yani the military expeditions, the times that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and the companions would go out either in defense or in offense for the Muslim lands. And you know what? We worked out that there's takriban one going out every three or four months in Medina at that time. Imagine your husband going out with a military unit every three or four months, four, three, four months, maybe a couple of months, come back in a couple of days, off they go again. Can you imagine if that was happening now? Can you imagine what the women's response would be? Oh, you went, yeah, I need two, you did two duties, two tours, they call them, isn't it? In modern nonsense, but quite, yeah, tours. You know, tour of Iraq and tour of Afghanistan. So, the, 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 you know this, this uh, thing, and you know, where did you see? Where did you see the Sahabiyat say anything like this? Any of the Mashaykh here or anyone can show me, because I, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to yani, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take my, my statement back. I cannot find a statement from the thousands of people that went out this, yani, hundreds and hundreds of times. I can't find a single in the, in the Sahih. In the authentic narrations, I can't find a single statement of complaint from the, from the female companions of the Prophet ﷺ. That's insane. That's unbelievable. That's because they had this greater aspiration. They were ready to sacrifice for the Akhirah. That's what we have to do. That's just seriously what we have to do. And I, I'm running out of time. I hate this thing, Yanni, subhanAllah. Right? The, um, I've got a, you know... If I don't give some kind of ending to this talk, they'll say they just, you know, shouted and shouted and that's it. So I've got to give you some kind of substance, right? Let me just tell you something. How can we actually do something practical to ourselves see that we're moving forward? See those actions that we're moving, actually doing something. First of all, I would say, and I was looking at some of the, the, uh, the essays which are written by some of the contemporary scholars on increasing ibadah. You know ma'roof, yani doing good. A lot of people do good. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Right? A lot of us are involved in good activities, whether it's studying, seeking knowledge, promoting knowledge, whether it's giving charity and so on and so forth. But that action of seeking, of doing good, has got to have conditions. You need to examine your act of good to first and foremost see if you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is so important because if you're not doing it for Allah's sake alone, then that act of good, you can as well chuck it in the bin. Because if it's not for the sake of Allah, then it's for the sake of the person that you're doing it for. And if it's for the sake of the person you're doing it for, then their thanks that they give to you is your reward. And if you're happy with that, then well done because you are a fool. Because if you are happy with just the thanks of people for your good action, then you didn't even understand what good actions was in the first place. You didn't even understand what ma'roof was. When you look at the companions in the Asr of Abbas, narrated by Imam Zuhri, Abbas said that when you do an action, you have to do three things. Ta'jil, tasghir, and you have to keep it hidden. You have to do it quick, you have to consider it insignificant, and you have to keep it hidden. Let's take the last one first. Hidden. Why do you keep an act hidden? Because you don't want people to think that you did it for them. You know that you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. If you do some good to a person, don't be going around and then telling people that, you know, this is what I did. You want to test whether you have really done something for the sake of Allah? I'll give you an example. Let's think of someone that you have given money to, sponsored, orphan, or, I don't know, a, a student to take a class, take some studies. Paid good money, I mean. And then that person then comes back to you and then he treats you so bad. 
And he's so ungrateful. And he says, you didn't give me nothing. What did you do? Yani, give me a couple of dollars. Yani, ishhadi. Yani, what's this? It means nothing to me. Yani, who are you anyway? Yani, this is you hard. Right? So you start to think, yani, subhanAllah, I was charitable to you. I was generous to you. And you treat me like this, yani? I ask you, when that person comes to you with that, how are you going to respond? Because if you respond like I just did there, like, how, the, you know, how dare you speak to me like that, then you know right there and then that your act was not solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if it was, you wouldn't care what this person says. In fact, if it was truly for the sake of Allah, you would be delighted that this person is being so ungrateful because Allah will reward you more for it. Because if you say, you know, that's okay, brother, I'm sorry if I, you know, I upset you, I, I apologize, and that's hard because, you know, I don't know how anyone could do that. But if you can lift your game to that level, then wallahi, your act was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the idea of keeping it hidden. Secondly, don't think that your act should be significant. When you do something for someone, don't think that you're such a hero because you're not because this is Allah's fadl upon you, his wealth that he gave to you, his ability that he gave to you. It's all from him. You're just passing on the khair. You're not doing anything from yourself. So don't think you're the big man. You know Umar or Abu Bakr. So when you go and, you know, you're seeing, you know, problems. I, you know, I'm looking at some people. I remember a sheikh telling us that, uh, people are uh, giving money to those to help them get married and that's something very important in our community and I'm happy to see now amongst the Muslims these kind of movements to help Muslims get married in a good correct way but in some communities the real problem is not actually the Muslims but to try and find the mahar itself the dowry so you might find that there was one person he he got the money together and he even helped the brother by giving her the sister Yani, he looked in his circles and he found this girl, good sister, and he said, here you go, here's some money, and get the job done. Khalas. Okay, that's it. That should be you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then expect your reward. What's this person do? One week, two weeks later, the brother comes along, he sees him, he says, hey bro, how's everything going, man? How's the sister? She's nice, yeah? Are you enjoying marriage, Yani? Brother's like, uh, yeah. Yeah, alhamdulillah, it's okay. Okay then, great. So then he goes away, he sees him a couple of weeks later, and he says, so, hey bro, how's the wife? How's the marriage? Like, this guy's like, what the heck is this, man? What is this? Yeah, alhamdulillah, it's okay, yeah, alhamdulillah, it's good. So he sees him again, and he says the same thing to him. The brother's thinking, what are you doing to me, man? Toba that I took money from you. Toba that I did this to you, Toba that I stole your help. Yani, your charity has basically made him a prisoner to you for the rest of his life. You every single time reminding him. And people do that. You do someone a favor. Ah, oh, you see, remember that favor I did for you? Okay, then yeah, okay. Then you go and then you see him again. You remember that favor I did for you? Yeah, he... Wallahi, I regret that I asked you to help me for a favor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Oh, you who believe. Do not invalidate your charity by keep on reminding people and hurting them with these words. Muslims do that. I see Muslims day and night who do that. Reminding the people of their good. Reminding people of that I did this for you. I did a favor for you. What's wrong with you? What happened to the generation of people who did these things for the sake of Allah? What happened to people actually reading the Quran and acting upon it? No And we don't want anything from you. We did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people, man. These are the kind of Muslims that we want to try and be ourselves. We need to instill that into our, 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 our psyche. And doing it quick. When someone seeks your help, or you, these three conditions I'm just applying just to as a random act of goodness, by the way. If you're about to do a random act of goodness, lend someone some, something, give some charity, do it quick. Yeah, and when the person comes to you and opens his mouth, don't let him finish a sentence, just give it to him. Don't let him there and humiliate himself and ask and stand there and I don't know, I hope you don't mind and I hope you this, that, whatever. And then you say to him, yeah, okay, come back in two weeks' time. Come back in a month's time. Ask me tomorrow, text me, email me, subhanAllah. He hasn't yani, humiliated him enough yani, there and then that you want him to do it again, second time and the third time. Do it quick. This is the way. 
And also I want to say something uh, 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 which is it's on my mind and I wanted to, for the people, the Muslims here who really do want to take it to the next level, and I know that we have Muslims here that do, don't belittle other people in their attempts either. You know, because there's a lot of times that when people you know, take this kind of competing thing a bit too far, you should get happy when other Muslims are trying to push themselves. And don't belittle those that you don't see trying to push themselves. Because you belittling those who are suffering and falling behind is a sign that your aspiration is low as well. It's a sign that your heart is not pure. That was not the way of our Islam. Yani our earlier generations did not act like that. You know, there's an amazing story, and it's not very authentic, but there was, a, in the time of the Tabi'een, there was a man, a Bedouin. He became Muslim. And he's a basic guy. I mean, like, we are talking super basic, right? To the basic to the level that, yani, he was told, listen, you know, there's a thing called Hajj. He goes, Hajj? He goes, yeah, Hajj, you got to go to Mecca and do Tawaf. He goes, okay, well, I'll go there and find out. So super basic, yani, yeah? Yeah, and like, like, like the kind of you know, guys you see walking around in Mississauga, and that kind of basic, yeah? <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, I had to hate on Mississauga at least once in this talk, you know what I mean? Anyway, so he goes around and he gets to uh, Mecca, he does his Tawaf, all right. So, he's finished the Tawaf, and then he sees this circle there, and he sees loads of people, and man in the middle, and he's thinking, wow, what's this? And so he goes to this man, he goes, Yanni, what is this? What's going on here? Ah, this is a, a scholar. What's his name? Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ish, Yanni? Abdullah ibn Abbas. Who is Abdullah ibn Abbas? Oh, well, he's the cousin of the Prophet sallam, and he is the one who has been uh, told that he is the Mufassir of Quran, Tajuban al Quran, and he's a big Yanni scholar, and, 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 and. He goes, and this, you know, it's amazing. When you read this athar, when you read this narration, um, it, yeah, you can like have like this kind of Hollywood light on it. I'm obviously shining the Hollywood light on it, right? So he's being told and he's like completely not interested. So it's like going in one ear because he has no idea what it means that he's mufassir and tarjuman al-Quran and he's this and he's that. So he's not kind of, you know, really focused on that because it means nothing to him. So he goes, look, 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 just, okay, Will he, will he allow me to ask him questions? Just tell me that. And the man says to him, sure. So he goes, okay. So, he, you know, he's a Bedouin, right? They're rough, yani. If you've ever seen Bedouin, you know? So he goes through the people, yani, kick this one out of the way, kick this one out of the way, yani, whatever. And he's such a miskin, yani, basic, yani, think about that guy in Mississauga, yeah? He, <laughs> and whilst he's walking, he's forgotten the name of who he's speaking to. So, you know, he's been told Abdullah ibn Abbas, yani, right? So we're talking like a few minutes. He's forgotten the whole name, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Mufassir ibn Tarjim. So he gets to him and he goes, and he gets to him. He goes, Ya Hada. <laughs> yani, hey, mister. To Abdullah ibn Abbas. You know, you know, it's amazing. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas smiles at him. He goes, how can I help? You know, these people are bamboozled, right? That like... They've been thrown left and right and whatever, and there's this guy, and he's saying this. He goes to him, how, how can I help you? He goes, I'm li I'm li in Islam. Tell me something about Islam. Anything. Just tell me something. So Abdullah ibn Abbas smiles at him. He goes, so, um, shall I recite something to you from the Quran? The book of Allah? The Bedouin goes to him, Awa anzal Allah ala nabihi Qur'ana? Did Allah send a Qur'an to his Prophet? Did Allah send a Qur'an, a book to his Prophet? That's the first time I'm hearing this. Right? So Abd Abd al smiles at him and says, yes, he did. He did. So he goes, yeah, tafaddal then. So he goes to him, Abd al Abbas thinks for a second, and he says to him, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِزْقُكُمْ وَمَا تُوْعَدُونَ and your provision is already written in the heavens. It is promised for you. It's not going anywhere. This Bedouin, he goes, Bas khalas, that's enough. Bas kafi, yani, that's enough. Now, yani, you know, Abdullah ibn Abbas just looks at him. Doesn't yani, feel insulted. Doesn't, yani, because you know what it is, and he smiles. You know why he smiles? Because he knows that perhaps this man is understanding just what I've said to him better than any other person will who will come after him. 
Because this Abdullah ibn Abbas is a qadr for insan. He doesn't assume. He ne never assume, by the way, folks. You know, when I, was in, when I was studying in university, my teacher said to me, he said to me, do never, never assume. I said, why never assume? He goes, because it makes an ass out of you and me. A-S-S-U-M-E. You got that, right? Okay. Anyway. So, Abdullah ibn Abbas. God, you guys in Canada are slow, man. <laughs> Where's my Brits, man? Where's my Brits? I see five or ten Brits, man. It's okay, bro, you know. Anyway. So, <laughs> you're going to love this, guys. I'm not going to show you. We're in the red, basically. Anyway. Right. So, what I want to say to you is that, you know, subhanAllah, on the issue of not disrespecting the person in front of you, there's a, there's a story about Abu uh, Hamid al-Ghazali that, you know, he was obviously a big scholar and he had huge scholars in his circles. And he used to say to himself, I've got to be really careful that I don't have, uh, I don't get uh, kibber, I don't get arrogant that I'm teaching all these big scholars, that I don't yani, lose my head here. And he, he was a good yani, man, obviously, rem reminding himself that I don't lose the plot, I don't lose the plot. So what happens one day is that there's a man in his, uh, in his circle and he says, I have a question. Ya Shaykh, Ya Aba, ya Aba Hamid, I have a question for you. You recited in Salatul Maghrib the statement of Allah, Kullu yawmin huwa fi sha'an. Kullu yawmin huwa fi sha'an. Every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordaining a matter, ordaining something. Something is happening, new. What does that mean? What does that mean? <sighs> Abu Hamid is like, whoa. That's a hardcore question. Allahu A'lam. I don't know the answer to that. Give me until tomorrow and, you know, I'll think about it and I'll reflect about it. So, khalas, okay then. So, the next day comes. He comes back. He goes, you have to think about it. Give me another day. He comes back the second day. Give me another day. He comes back the third day. Give me another day. And then, then, he has a dream that night. And in this dream, in this story, which is, Annie, not very authentic, but it's good enough for us, Annie, the... In this dream, the Prophet ﷺ comes to him. So, the Prophet ﷺ says that to Abu Hamid, if a man comes to you and says to you, what is the meaning of the statement, then say to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many of these uh, issues and matters that have been shown to the people now but they have been ordained from before so meaning that meaning this is such a hard aqidah question by the way meaning that they have already been ordained but people are only seeing them every day so for them it's like a new thing every day but they've been or they've been done and ordained way way before depending upon the people's reaction to them they will be raised by it or they will be disgraced by it. Oh, my mom wakes up. He's buzzing. He's like, wow. So he then goes next day, dressed up, ready, goes into the circle, and he's sitting there, and he looks in the people, he says, where's this person who asked me this question about Kullu Yawman Huwa Fi Sha'an? So this man, he comes, and he goes, it was me, Abu Hamid, yani, it was me who asked this question. So he goes, aha, I have the answer for you. Inna lillahi umuran, yubadiha, wa la yabtadiha. Repeats the whole exact statement like that. What do you think about that? And this man, he says to Abu Hamid, he goes, Ya Abu Hamid, Ya Abu Hamid, Increase your peace, O oh Abu Hamid, increase your blessings and peace upon the one who taught you this in your sleep. Imam Abu Hamid yani, is like, I chose the wrong person to play here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't ever assume things against other people. You may say, see something just because he asks you a question, or maybe because he seems yani, basic. Don't think that he's worse than you. He could be so much better than you. And those were our people. Our people don't give it big. They act big. They don't look big. They think big. They dig deep and they act this thing is flashing. I think they're doing some crazy thing to it. I don't know. And now they've sent the, the, the thingy. Now, now they've sent the heavies. What is this? Boon is a heavy? Are you kidding me? I pick, I pick him with one hand like this. 
This is send yani some people yani. You send him Buna Muhammad al Ahdiki, what are you doing? My claim to fame, my claim to fame, I should be, I should be happy, alhamdulillah. My claim to fame is that I am followed by Buna Muhammad. <laughs> On Twitter. <laughs> I can die happy. <laughs> Just kidding, bro. Just kidding. I'll, I'll close because Yeni is going to get upset and he's going to find a rap. He's going to go on YouTube. He's going to get one million, <laughs> one million hits and he's going to curse me out or something. I don't know. Yeah, I can't be doing that. Jazakumullah khair. I know that there was.